Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Talking City podcast from the Manchester Evening News on the eve of the Premier League season or even the day the Premier League season starts with Manchester United playing tonight. City not in action till Sunday. We'll be looking ahead to the new campaign today. I'm Tyro Marshall in the hosting chair today. I'm joined by Joe Bray. Joe, uh, rate your Premier League excitement from one to ten for me. I genuinely don't know if I'm excited or not. I think sat at Stamford Bridge, I'll be like, okay, I'm ready for this. But I think with the Euros and then like, it was great to be in America for the pre-season, but it feels like there's not been a break as such in terms of football. So, and knowing that it's a, it's going to be like an 11, 12 month season. I think that's playing on my mind. When we were driving down to Wembley and back, we are thinking we've got a lot of these drives coming up. Yeah. But as I say, sit me at Stamford Bridge on Sunday and I'll be like, yeah, Joe, I'm, I'm ready for this. And, I think when when we see all the football on and, you know, it's like you say, it's on tonight and we, it's, it's back to back and you're watching it, I'll, I'll probably change my tune. So if you ask me next week, I'll be really excited. But now I'm just thinking, oh, it's going to be a long year. Yeah, I think I'm in the same boat. It does feel like it doesn't stop these days, doesn't it? And like you say, I think five five Northern teams in the Premier League this year, we're going to be we're going to be seeing that Avanti Rail service or the M6 an awful lot this season, it's fair to say. And, and Titia starting that way, heading down to the capital for the opening game and a player who might have been in that team and was certainly in my fantasy football team for £5 million, looked an absolute bargain after a, a phenomenal pre-season, probably the star of pre-season for City, Oscar Bob, dealt an incredibly cruel blow this week with a, a training ground injury, a fracture of his leg, uh, gone to have surgery now, probably going to miss two, three months at least. Um, it's, I mean, it's it's a devastating blow for City. It's an even more devastating blow for, for a young player who was really building some momentum. Yeah, I mean, if you listen, listen I'm sure you did listen to our podcast uh, earlier in the week and we were both saying, get Oscar Bob in your fantasy team. And I did the same and I've had to uh, had to let him go because, I mean, yeah, normally you, you, you see these injuries and you think, oh, it's a blow for the club and it's unlucky for the player. But it just feels really, really cruel on Oscar Bob because he was... He was so good in the summer in in uh, the USA and on the tour, and you, you thought this is finally his chance. He's got probably two or three games where he's going to start on that wing, and he can make it his own. And I think it was two goals, four assists in five friendlies. You're thinking this kid's going to have a real role to play, and then out of nowhere that happens. And if it's a, a, no, a non-contact leg break, you, you can only imagine how a painful that must have been. But he like just devastating, and I think. It, He's a yeah, he's a lovely lad, and you just couldn't have picked a, a player who deserved a good start to the season more than Oscar Bob. So it's it's a blow for City because one of the best players to start the season is now out for a number of months. But it's also a big blow for him because he's going to come back, and you've got Foden, Bernardo, Doku, probably Savinho, all in the swing of things, and and knowing their place in the team, and he's going to have to fight his way back in. So it's it couldn't have come at a worse time. For Oscar Bob, but also it throws City's preparations for Chelsea into a bit of a, a bit of a spin because who do you play? You probably have to play Savinio now on that wing when maybe you wanted to ease him in. Phil Foden's only been back a few days. You, you don't. I don't think they will start him because it would be a risk to start him after such a long summer and only three four days training. It's it has sort of put City's preparations into a bit of a. Uh, a bit off kilter and you know since the community shield they've lost julian alvarez who wouldn't have played but they've lost him as an option and you're thinking okay you've got players like oscar bob playing well this is really good and then bob gets an injury but i think one thing about the the injury is the amount of commentary we've seen on do city need to sign another player which sort of shows how well bob was thought of among the fan base and and elsewhere people saw him as a, a genuine first team option which says a lot considering he was just a fringe player last year but it might be the the fact that people just want signings, but it might also be Bob had done so much over the last few months to put himself in that position and now it's been sort of snatched away from him. Yeah, uh, do City need a replacement for Oscar Bob is a sentence no one really expected to say in, in May. There were flashes of his quality last season. The goal at Newcastle was was absolutely brilliant, but he, he wasn't really expected to kind of make this impact, but he's been brilliant in pre-season. I agree with you. He's probably going to find it hard now to play the role that, that he might have done had he been fit at the start. I think we all expected him to start at Chelsea. Now, if he's back fit in December, say, he's going to find it hard to force Foden or Grealish or Savinho out of the team. But the City have now lost a player who would have been earmarked to start the season. They've lost Alvarez. Do they need to sign a replacement for Oscar Bob? 
the temptation is yes, they do because you're looking at those options and the players coming back and we were saying on Monday or Tuesday when we recorded the last podcast, if Alvarez has gone, surely you move Foden into the centre and he can play that role, deputising for De Bruyne and Haaland and, and giving them rests. But now you think actually Foden might be needed maybe on the left to allow Doku on the right or Bernardo or the, it, it changes the dynamic all over again. And all the questions the summer is, are they going to sign a number 10 and number six? And you're thinking just one or two players removed from that equation makes you think they do need to sign them. But I also think they won't because last season they didn't want to sign a replacement for De Bruyne because it would have added to the competition when he came back. It would have just created a problem down the line, even if it solved a short-term problem. And if you, if you are going to commit to playing Oscar Bob and commit to him being part of your future, then you've got to sort of say, no, we'll cope while you're out and we'll welcome you back. And then you've got that role waiting and they're, they're going to wait until Bob has had his surgery and, and they know how long he's out before deciding. They'll know who's on the market. The the names of of uh, Paqueta that went out the window, Eberechieze, they know how much he's going to cost. This won't change whether they're interested in him or not. I just don't, I can't see them doing it because... I think they're not a, re a reactionary club in the transfer market and this would be a reactionary move. So all the fans hoping for a, a transfer, I just think, just wait and see. They've coped with big players missing before. They've sold Vincent Company, they've sold Sergio Aguero, they've not signed replacements or they've let both of those players go, I should say. Yeah, it feels like the chances, the chances of a replacement are slim. But saying that, on the other hand, Last season, they signed Nunes and Doku late in the window. Season before, they signed Akanji. If there's a deal there to be done, they they probably will go for it. So it's it's one of them never say never, but you would guess that it's leaning towards stick with what you've got and deal with it. And let's not forget they've signed Savino for thirty million. He's mm. got he had a hand in twenty odd goals in in La Liga last year. That's arguably your replacement. He's there already. Yeah, exactly. They can probably get by, can't they? They can certainly get by for now. And talking of letting players go, Calvin Phillips is heading out the door again. Ipswich on a season-long loan deal this time. Hopefully for, for Phillips, it goes better than his uh, second half of last season loan move to West Ham. He he desperately needs a good season to, to kick forward. And for City, I mean, he's at least he's off the books. They're going to be recouping the a lot of the wages now. They're going to be getting a loan fee for him. And they need him to have a good season to have any chance of selling him. Because let's be honest, these these loans are stop gaps, aren't they? If City could sell him permanently, they would. But right now, no one is going to take a risk on on signing Calvin Phillips permanently because he's he's just not done it for two years. Yeah, and City aren't going to get forty two million back for him no. at the moment. But I mean, even if he has a fantastic season at Ipswich, and I hope he does, because there is a, a good player in there. We saw that in pre season when he played at centre back even if that sort of cemented how far out of Guardiola's plans it, he is. Even if he has a good season, he's not going to return a £40 million player. I think he's going to be 29, pushing 30 next season. You, you're not going to spend that kind of money. But he does have a, he's still got a contract until 2028, which feels absolutely mad. So there is still some value in there. If something can happen, there is some some value. But you, you feel like he's a player where you're making a loss. And yeah, we... You can look at Alvarez and the, the incredible profit they've made, but there are some deals like Phillips where it just it just hasn't worked out. And I think, yeah, taking him out of the spotlight and going to a relegation side could actually help. It's probably similar to the environment he had at Leeds where he was so, so good. Mm. Sounded like Pep Guardiola there, didn't that? So, so good. <laughs> so, um, so good. But yeah, when he went to West Ham there pushing for Europe, it's sort of the business end of the season. He had to get fit but used the games to do that and it just he made the mistakes and it all unravelled from there. If he he's he's got the fitness now, he's played in pre season. He should play regularly for Ipswich. He might not be on the winning side. But I suppose he could look at someone like Ross Barkley who did a similar move for for Luton last year and actually turned out quite an impressive mm. player for them and, and got a decent move on the back of it. So maybe that's what City will be hoping he can do. I, when you're looking at, was it Ipswich, uh, Ip, Ipswich, Everton and Fulham were interested. You can see why Ipswich appeals out of those. Everton would be probably quite a dogfight. They're probably going to be down the bottom, but 
and not the most expansive of teams. Ipswich try and play a certain way and will do that in the Premier League regardless of where they are. Fulham, you don't really know what you're going to get, probably mid-table, but he's got something to fight for every week at, at Ipswich. So I can see why he's chosen them and I can see it going quite well. But yeah, whether whether he does enough to get City anywhere near the money they paid for him next summer, it, I'd, I'd be surprised. Yeah, definitely. And like I said, I think there's a stable structure there under Kieran McKenna that he will probably slot into quite well. And the advantage is that he's gone for the full season. He's he's gone not early in pre-season, obviously, but he's got enough time to you know, maybe spend the rest of this month getting up to speed, training with his new teammates. It's a lot easier now to make an impression than it is being thrown into West Ham midway through a season and, and trying to adapt when there's games every three days. You know, that, that's a difficult environment to go into. So this should suit him and should hopefully allow him to have a season where he can show what quality still does have and, and try and maybe get some kind of auction going for him or interest in him next year. Because I think we all know it's it's done for him at City. And, and even if they not had this move, he wouldn't have been in the frame to, to start on Sunday. But the question is, who who does start? Um, Foden, Walker and Stones back this week from England duty. Maybe the bigger one is Rodri back from Spain duty. We know how important Rodri is to this City team. Like we say, there's, there's no Phillips there now. Uh, Kovacic could perhaps play that role. What do you do with those England internationals with Rodri? Do we see any of them starting? And I mean, can they afford to start Rodri? But equally, can Guardiola afford not to start him at, at Chelsea? It's a, re- it's a real dilemma, isn't it, given his, his value to this team? He's probably, I think we've said it countless times now, but he's, he's the most important player in terms of coming out of that team, I think. Especially at Chelsea, where the games are always mm. chaotic and you just want someone in the middle to just put the foot on the ball and, and calm things down. But, I mean, he returned on Wednesday. So, having not played and going straight into a Premier League game, I think would be a bigger risk than than leaving him out. I could potentially see the England players playing a bit, probably not starting. but And I think they've got enough options just about to cover those players. But no, I don't think you can afford to risk Rodri, given how, how late he returned. And if City spend a couple of weeks three weeks easing him back in, they'll thank themselves later in the season. And I think they know that. And Rodri is vocal in the media about how many games he plays. So he's going to be pretty clear about mm. how long he needs to get back up to speed behind the scenes as well. Yeah, you've got Kovacic. Nico O'Reilly played in the uh, in the Community Shield and, and played quite well against Chelsea two weeks ago in Columbus. But we were saying on, on Tuesday, I don't think O'Reilly... While he was very good, he also gave the ball away a few times and he was quite raw. It might be the time just to drop him to the bench, let him come off off the bench and maybe play Bernardo Silva a bit further back, who just knows knows everything a little bit better. And It's not a Rodri replacement, but Kovacic and Bernardo is as good a midfield as you're going to find in the Premier League and should be more than enough to beat Chelsea. And I think Rico Lewis will start ahead of Walker because he's fitter, but also he's played really, really well. In pre-season, and, that, and I mean now Oscar Bob isn't there. Lewis is your your standout performer from pre-season, and if he he can play it right back and invert inside, that adds another sort of layer of protection. You you play Manu Akanji, he can step up if if he needs to as well. You you've got the options there to to cover it. It might be one of them games. I mean the pre-season game was ridiculous in terms of how often Chelsea gave the ball away, but they also managed two goals against City at the same time. It was 4-4 last year at, at Stamford Bridge, and it always seems to be one of those games where rules go out the window, mm. especially away at Chelsea. It always seems to be nervy, loads of transitions, mistakes, sort of will score more than you vibe in terms of how both teams approach the game. And I, I would imagine that's the kind of game that Chelsea would want as well. That's probably the, their best chance of of getting anything from the game. So I, I think it'll be the same. And yeah, Rodri missing will play into that, but City should have enough. I can see, yeah, Doku on one side, he started in the Community Shield. You're probably going to have to play Savinho on the other. Kevin De Bruyne came off the bench. You might want to rest him, but I don't think they can. He can he can play at number 10. And when you look at that that midfield, it's, it's not too bad. I, I'm, I'm also assuming that Grealish is not fit. We'll hear from Guardiola later but he was not sort of concrete on whether he would play this game when he spoke at Wembley and if there's any risk as much as it's annoying for Grealish to to be missing out when this was his chance to to start the season I think you uh you don't take that risk and bring Grealish back for for Ipswich next week 
Yeah, and it's been noticeable that Guardiola has been preaching patience really with with Grealish this summer and talking about you know small steps and things like that. So I don't I don't think he'd risk him when he's trying to clearly trying to build his his confidence and his belief in his game back up. And yeah, like I say, it is it's always wild at Chelsea, isn't it? So it'll be interesting to see, especially with a new a new manager there. Last season's for all, I had a little coffee spilled on my laptop at half time and it gave way and completely blew up for the second half. So any improvement on that for us this weekend. <laughs> would be welcome. Uh, That's all for part one of the City Podcast. We'll be back after the break to look ahead to the new season in a bit more depth and see what City have done and need to do in the transfer market still. Welcome back to the Talking City Podcast. Uh, the transfer window still open then for another couple of weeks. But as we look at it now, Joe Savinio, um, the big name in, like you say, probably going to start this weekend. How do we assess City's window at, at the moment? We maybe expected more to be done when it hasn't been, but we know they are very patient. The previous two windows have been have been pretty big. Um, I think there was maybe a view that a midfielder would come in, but after two fairly substantial windows in terms of the number of players City are bringing in this one's been been a little quieter what do you what do you make of it so far yeah it's, it's tricky isn't it I, I do think they need another option in midfield to help Rodri but mm. if Kovacic can take that mantle a little bit more then you've sort of already got your your replacement and then you look at Liverpool and their attempts to sign a number six and it, it might be one of them years where there's just no number sixes around and mm. It's a it's a tough ask to ask someone to come in and say you're not going to play because Rodri's there, but you, you're only there to come off the bench and, and play in the cups to to give him a rest. And I mean, Alvarez did that for Haaland and and left after two years because he he wanted to play more. So it's you can see why it's not been particularly easy to to find a number a number six. Maybe they could have looked for a number eight. The names I mentioned earlier and and Bruno Guimaraes was was a, mentioned earlier in the summer. Those players don't come cheap. I do think that that area of the pitch needs to be looked at in the next couple of years. And I was I was wondering whether they'd do something this year to get ahead of the game and and allow a player a year to to settle in and 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 that and they've done that in the past. I mean, Rodri took a year or so to to get used to it. So did Jao Cancelo, Bernardo Silva. There's a lot of players who've needed that time. So I thought they might have potentially looked at that to to then give a player a chance to say uh, Kevin De Bruyne leaves next summer. You've got a player firing and ready to go rather than coming in from from square one. But again, if the deal isn't right, City don't go for it. And they, they don't they don't look to have been convinced that there is anyone capable of, of doing that. And the fact that they've recalled James McAtee and they see him as the, the option there, A, it's cheaper, but B, he knows the, he knows the system as well. Guardiola knows him. He'll have learned from what's happened at Sheffield United. He's not going to be the same as a 50, 50 million player, but he could have a really big role to play. And the same with the plan that was with Oscar Bob to to give him a an increased workload and responsibility. That's been set back a little bit, but you can you can see that the tactic has been sign a player if they're there and if they'll improve. But if they don't, we'll just manage anyway. And you, you could argue as well, keeping Edison, keeping De Bruyne, keeping Bernardo they've been just as important for this season as signing a new multi-million pound player. And we're saying this, of course, there's another few weeks of the transfer window and they might sign someone else. But yeah, it's been slow and I can see why fans will be frustrated. But you can also completely see the logic behind what City have or haven't done. Yeah, and that logic has has, has borne fruit over the last you know, nine years. It's It's been a strategy that you cannot argue with the success and their right to only go for players that, that they want. And I think there's there's been less pressure because we all expected more players to go. Obviously, the goalkeeping situation was was uncertain, but mid- midfield has been the key area. And De Bruyne is is, is clearly going to stay now. I think he'll probably go next year, but that's that's a big one. And, and Bernardo, like you say, every year it's it's an unknown, but it looks like he's going to stay as well. So it's kind of taking the pressure off a bit, even if there is value in in like you say bringing a player in to to learn on the ropes for a year. But it, it does give James McAtee a, a chance to shine and. Maybe try and force his way in next year. They've always got that option of moving Foden central as well and and, and using McAtee uh, in a role if De Bruyne does go next year. But we'll see down the line what what happens there. I think that's we don't the point know what as well with with Foden. You, you've got Savinho now, 
You've got yeah. Doku who's getting better. The idea is that Grealish should be better than he was last year. And he's had a full pre-season. You, you absolutely have the the space to play Foden solely as a central player now. Yeah. And yeah, Alvarez is gone, but Foden could be your false nine. He he can be your sort of new signing and your De Bruyne, De Bruyne replacement if if you want him to be. And he can also play on the left and the right. So he's. I think it's going to be a big season for him, especially after winning player of the year. Everyone's going to say he needs to play in the centre and now he's there is that path open. They've played the dual number 10s. They've played him as sort of a number nine, a, a false nine, number eight even. He's got that yeah. versatility and I think, you, yeah, there, there's not been a new signing in that area, but the, there's been enough movement that Foden can be there full time, which I think could be quite <clears throat> important. Yeah, definitely. And like I say, if Bob does come back and, and continues that impact, it... It takes the pressure off Foden ever really needing to to play wide, even though there will obviously be games there. And he can kind of replace he can replace Alvarez, he can maybe replace De Bruyne in the team next year and, and make that role his own. So, you know, he he has been freed up with with what's gone on this year in terms of Savinio and, and Bob's emergence. And that that definitely does make a difference. Uh, predicting City's season then and what's gonna make it a success or otherwise. Uh, very difficult to do, I guess. Avoiding a points deduction would, would probably uh, be considered a success, but you know, there's the, the charges and the hearing is a huge unknown, and it makes makes predictions and and kind of gauging what makes City season a success very very difficult. Yeah, definitely. And I'm I'm thinking I've I've done my pre season bets and put City as I think they're going to win the league because they are the best team, mm. but maybe the the wiser bet, surely the Premier League are going to stick some sort of points deduction for even if they can get something minor to stick. And that's probably going to be the difference between potentially letting Arsenal get in there. So let, let's let's look at it away from the sort of potential of points deductions and, and whatever's happening, because that's going to be there, but we just don't know. We've been saying all the way through, we, we've got no idea what's going to happen. And th- there's also Guardiola's future. that I think that's going to play a big, big role in, in is he going to stay Say he he says halfway through the season he's going to leave. Liverpool that happened to them last season with the Jurgen Klopp and they completely tailed off. So they're going to have to manage that as well. It's not it's not going to be a normal season by by any means. But in terms of football, City remain the best team, and I think if they don't win the Premier League, they'll be disappointed. Um, and I think they'll be looking at the Champions League, especially if it is going to be Guardiola's last season. As can they can they get him to sign off? with that and get get one over on Real Madrid again after that battle that's been going back and forth for the last few years. I think if you offered them one of the Premier League and Champions League, they'd be happy. If you offered them both, they'd be delighted. And then they've obviously got the Club World Cup at the end of the season, which they'll be targeting as well. So, it's, it, yeah, it's. I don't think it's going to be another treble year or a, a year where they're going to win everything. I think they're going to have to manage the resources. But... They've, they've had Premier League seasons where they've been thin on the ground and they've still mm. chipped away every single week and, and put these long runs together and, and won it. And they remain the best team. They've only lost their backup striker and they've added one of La Liga's best players. So you, you have to say that they're they're going to go again and, and be favourites for the for the title. Yeah, it, it's going to be a very long season with the, the extra... Champions League game with the Club World Cup at the end of it. It's going to be a fascinating season as well with, with like we say, the hearing and the charges and any potential appeal for that with Guardiola's future. I mean, it feels like that is going to dominate the first few months of the season. What What's he going to do? When's an announcement going to come? What decision is he going to make? City are favourites. 11 to, I'm trying to look here, 11 to 8 favourites to win the league. I think, you know, we'd both agree with that. Arsenal, I would say Arsenal is their only potential challengers. I don't see anyone else winning the league apart from City or Arsenal. And, Arsenal have been making progress under Arteta. It's, it's just a case of whether they can get over the line. I was talking to someone about it yesterday and they've, they've certainly got Liverpool under Klopp vibes when they kept getting closer and closer and then just got there. But I, I just don't, I'm still not convinced the fact that they're Arsenal, just still, I'm still not convinced that they will find a way to to get over the line. And City, City are 11 to 1 to go down as well when Arsenal are 2,000 to 1. So I think we can all work out why why that's the case. Uh, that, I'm not sure that just sums happen. up how unknown the season is going to be, doesn't it's it? It's incredible, yeah. yeah. You, you, I mean, City could occupy any one of 1 to 20 in that league, really. And you could, yeah. well, you could understand why it would happen because we just don't know what 
A, whether they're going to be found guilty, B, what the scale of the punishment is and, and then appeals mm-hmm. and, and things like that. I think we all just hope that it is, even with appeals, it is done and dusted by the end of the season so everyone knows where they stand because it, you know it's it's getting messy, the amount of legal challenges in the Premier League and, and things like that. And Obviously, City aren't the only club going into this season without hanging over them. Chelsea have got a pretty big case as well. Leicester are taking legal action, I think. More PSR stuff to come. It is it is becoming a court, a, a league played out in in the courts as much as on the pitch. And I think that that certainly needs to change. I hope that we can get some kind of resolution to that. And, and like you say, it's not just about the Premier League. I mean, if this is Pep's last season, I think if you offered Pep the Premier League or the Champions League, he would probably take the Champions League, wouldn't he? I, you know, his, his reign here has clearly been absolutely phenomenal. They have dominated English football. But if, if you were to sit down with Pep in Tast at the end of it all and say you won one Champions League while you were here, I think he'd consider that unders. He'd consider that under mm-hmm. par, I think, for the quality they've had, for the fact that they've clearly been the best team in Europe for more than one season. And you can imagine he will be desperate to, to add another Champions League trophy before he does go. Yeah, I, I I agree with that absolutely, but I also think the chance of winning five in a row, they've already done four in a row, which is unprecedented. Mm-hmm. But I think to leave, if he does leave, having set five in a row, it's a nice round number. No one's going to beat that for for a long, long time. He would sort of fall back and say, "All right, we came up against a really good Madrid side, and that I mean Madrid are the only team I think that are going to stop City winning the Champions League." But if they can win five in a row and, and leave that legacy in the Premier League, and yeah, who knows what's going to happen with the charges. I think that would make it sweeter if they could do that five in a row from a City point of view. I, I just think that that would be a, a, a pretty good consolation. And I think he will spend the rest of his career, this is going on the assumption that they're going to win the Premier League, but not the Championship, Champions League. He will spend the rest of his career saying, don't focus on Europe. Look at how mm. how much we dominated the Premier League and even if they don't win the Premier League that four in a row is a record that is there they might try and take it away but City have done it over over those four years and it's 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 a ridiculous sort of level of dominance and the, the fact that Liverpool have been so good under Jurgen Klopp and Arsenal have been really really good under Arteta and between them they've got one Premier League title to show for it just shows how good City have been and this is why you can't look past City assuming there's no points deductions that they, they're going to do it again. Because even if they're behind with, you know, 10 games to go, you can see them just putting a run together like they always do. And and Arsenal for the last two seasons have, have not been able to cope with that. So, yeah, like you say, they could finish 1-20, to 20, but before deductions or anything that happens, you've got to, you've got to say they're favourites. Yeah, absolutely. And they could, of course, win both. That's... Uh... Entirely oh, yeah. possible, and I'm, I'm sure they'll probably well, they'll be second favourites at worst for the Champions League, and, and they've got every chance of winning that. Right, that's all for the second part. We'll be back after the break just for a few uh, predictions that we hopefully won't look back on at the end of next, at the end of this season. Welcome back to the Talking City podcast. First weekend of the Premier League season then. Let's join in the fun with a few predictions. Joe, I think we probably did this last year. I think it might be me and you that did it. And I've got to say, I can't I can't remember what we went for. But let's just presume that we absolutely nailed it because why wouldn't we have done? Um, this year then, let's start with winner. I think we both just, just touched on it there. City? Yeah, as I say, City before any deductions. But yeah, yeah. I think... I might, I might have convinced myself to put a bet on Arsenal just for to sort of cover my bases. I think. Yeah, yeah. Presuming there's no asterisks, I think we're uh, we're, yeah. we're both thinking City will will get the job done again. Top four, I find it really hard to call this year. I think Arsenal and, and City will be top two. Beyond that, it's just, just completely it's open, really, isn't it? Really open. I still don't know what. I'm just not. There's a lot of uh, optimism amongst United fans. I've noticed this year. I just don't. I don't really see it. I'm still not convinced by United under Ten Hag. Liverpool under Slot. I could see them finishing eighth. I could see them finishing third. Then Tottenham, Chelsea, Villa have got the added pressure of the Champions League this year. I just find that it really hard to kind of call third to eighth. I guess. Yeah, I'm. I'm in the same boat, and I think. I think Liverpool won't be top four because of 
the new manager and I don't really think they've strengthened very much and even the key players are you know Van Dijk and, and Salah are just getting a little bit older and they might score five less goals or stop five less goals but that that makes a big difference um, I think United will get top four just because they've got a manager who obviously under pressure but he's been there two years and the squad is a bit similar that I think Delict is a good sign in I think I think the targeted areas that they need to, whether they're, they're going to be successful signings, we'll wait and see. But it, it might be like the year where they finished second to City and it was because no one else really was in a position to do that. Yeah. And they they happened to be OK enough and, and were there. So I, I can see them getting it. And similarly, I can I can see Tottenham because I think the postacoglu has got them playing well. They've got... I'm not sure Solanke's going to be a, a, worth a 65 million spend, but he is going to score goals for them. And that was probably what they, they missed last year was a, a proper goal scorer. So put him in that system. Again, by virtue of other teams being a bit chaotic. I think Chelsea are too chaotic to be top four, but they'll probably be Europa League again. Liverpool as well. I think I think Villa might struggle with with Europe. So I'm, I'm not putting them in, in top four. But yeah, it's I think after the top two, like you say, there's any of six teams could complete the the other two spots of the top four. Yeah, definitely. I I can see Villa backing it up. I think they've strengthened pretty well this year. And like you say, Europe is the big the big unknown. But the, the fact it's so open, I can see them. I can see them backing it up, and maybe not Champions League, but I can see them stick, sticking around top six for sure. Um, relegation then last year, three promoted teams went went straight back down. I I'm going to call it now. I see, I think Ipswich will stay up. Um, really? I think less than Southampton might go down, but I think Ipswich could stay up, and I'll go Forest to complete the the trio in terms of going down. Okay, so Forest is. I think Forest. I think their luck will run out, and I think mm. not having Steve Cooper will will cost them in in that way. And, and I don't know who they've signed because they always sign random players, and and you never know. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think it might be the last year for Forest. I think Leicester might stay up, possibly because of the the Steve Cooper factor. I put Ipswich because I think a bit like Luton, I think they'll do themselves proud, but just be on the end of one goal defeats too many times. I think Bournemouth as well. I think losing Solanke, I don't think they've. Mm-hmm. I know they're making a a big signing from from Porto, but I, mm. yeah, I I can't see it. But again, I I think that is one where I'll be proved wrong more than any other of these predictions because Iriola is a very good manager and he's got them playing well. But you need to score goals and I think they've lost the goal scorer. So that will make it quite tricky. That will make it a challenge. I can see. I I still think Iriola will, will do enough to to keep them up. Um, Southampton, we, I think, yeah, now you mentioned them, I think if, they, if yeah. they're not at bottom three, they'll be bottom four. Yeah, yeah. I think I think they're going to struggle to Southampton I mean, come up through the playoffs and a very unproven manager at this level um, who likes to play very good football. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes for them. Um, surprise package. I mean, I guess it, it depends what you term a surprise. I, I would have yeah. probably gone for Palace, who, who maybe you said wouldn't have been a surprise towards the end of last season, but they've lost the Lisi. Gway might be going. Anderson might be going. Feels a bit of a strange time for, for that squad to kind of be ripped up. And, and you know, Mateta, probably going to play this weekend. Be interested how he does. He, he Scored a lot of goals again in the Olympics. He seems to be really kicking on now. Eze is still brilliant, but Elise is a huge loss. And if they lose one of those centre halves, so never mind two, then that's that's a major problem for them. I could see Brighton getting getting back on it. Maybe they've got a very young manager, but made some good recruitment this year. But it's tricky. It's tricky to call a surprise package. And I'm I'm maybe leaning towards Fulham. To be honest, I can see I can see Fulham doing well this season. I, I can see them getting a result at Old Trafford tonight and. I can see them being top half at least. Yeah, I'd not. I think I just assume that Fulham are going to be between tenth and fourteenth every single season and play some good football, but also go on some runs where they t- they they lose quite a lot of games and and don't do a lot. But I mean, a couple of seasons ago, they were one of the teams that hurt City the most and and really pushed them. I'd, I'd put Palace, and now you've reminded me that they've lost Elise and could potentially lose Eze and, and Gahey. So. If they keep Eze and Gay, I think they will do quite well and probably be one of them teams that don't have European football so can can sneak up and, and do all right. Maybe Newcastle can I wouldn't 
necessarily class them as a surprise package, but if, if they've not got European football, that could help them again, a bit like when they got Champions League and uh, I think Wolves as well under O'Neill did very well last season and could be a third team without Europe to to potentially get top half and, and challenge for maybe even a Conference League place. But, uh, I mean, City went to Wolves and lost last year and, and they got a few decent results elsewhere along the league. So, yeah, I think they could be sort of a, a steady one. But I think losing Pedro Neto, they'll have to replace him. I think there's been talk of Carlos Borges, who was at City, replacing him. He's a very good player, an exciting player, but he's not of Neto standard just yet. So, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see but if anyone can get them firing it's it's O'Neill yeah definitely um Champions League I'm gonna go it's, it's gotta be City or Real Madrid I think I'm just not sure I see anyone else anyone else doing it and Real Madrid are, are just so hard to to actually kill in this competition but maybe maybe this will be City's year but I'm struggling to see beyond beyond those two what do you think for, for Champions League is there a, another team you can throw into that I think it would be fitting if it was a City Madrid final after all the semi finals mm. and, and quarter finals. Yeah, definitely. I think that would be a really good final. But I, I just think Mbappe has added an, a new level to them and even just watching them in the in the Super Cup, they were better than they were because of Mbappe and you got Mbappe, Bellingham, Vinicius and Rodrigo as your as your front line and you know, Valverde and Modric and all these players and you're thinking this this is sort of you return into the Galacticos era and City can beat them because they've beaten them two years ago and didn't lose against them last year. But yeah, maybe if it, over two legs, maybe City could beat them, maybe one. I, I don't know. I, I think it's been so close between them and it will be so close if they, if they come up again. Atletico perhaps with the made, making some mm. interesting signings, spending the money on, on Alves. I think they'll be hard to beat and if they can drag a team like City or Madrid down to sort of their scrappy level I know that's really sort of it, it's stereotypical of Atletico isn't it but when City played them two or three years ago it, it wasn't a good tie to watch it was attritional and if, if they can do that yeah. they now have a striker who can who can win them games so maybe someone like Atletico I'd like to see company do well at, at Bayern but I can't see them doing well enough to be better than City or Madrid no, no, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. Um, last one then, let's go domestically. Top scorer. Can can anyone challenge Erling Haaland as, as top scorer in the Premier League? If he gets injured, I think. <laughs> I, think I think if Haaland gets injured again for, for two or three months, maybe maybe Ollie Watkins or or someone else can can have a chance. But no, if, I mean, Haaland was meant to have, a bad, have had a bad season last year and he still, still scored, what, 30, 40 goals? So... Andy was injured for three months, so you know if if Haaland stays fit for the majority of the season, it's it's got to be him. Yeah, definitely. And if Haaland gets forty plus again this season, would he be City's Player of the Year? Who's who's going to be City's? Who are we going to be talking about at the end of this season as City's star man for for the season? I, you know, Haaland banged them in last season. It was pretty open with with Foden mm-hmm. and, and Rodri. Um, do you, do you see those three again? Do you see anyone else putting their name in the hat at the end of the year that we'll be talking about as maybe a, a Player of the Year candidate? Potentially De Bruyne again if he stays stays fit if he's got a point to prove. He was I don't think he played very well at the end of last season when he came back, but he's still scoring lots of goals. So if he if he plays well and still and scores all those those goals and and is the one giving Haaland all the assists, then it might be a sort of a final swan song again. Assuming that I mean he's out of contract and he, he looks like he might be mm. uh, open to another challenge at the end of the season. But yeah, when when you've got Haaland, De Bruyne, Foden, and Rodri as you your contenders, then it could be one of any of them. Uh, and then that's forgetting Bernardo and, and other players like that. Yeah. And, and last but not least, then City's surprise player or breakout star, however you want to look at it. I, I, I mean, I think we were all going to go Oscar Bob for this. And, and obviously, we, we've kind of talked him up already. He's going to miss a good chunk of the season now. I, I, maybe the one to watch would be right back. Could we see a change in the guard at, at right back this year? Might Rico Lewis kind of overtake Kyle Walker or at least split those duties a lot more than, than we normally see. We know, you know Guardiola loves Kyle Walker and, and what he brings in terms of leadership, but he's he's had his critics. He is getting on now. There's, there's probably a point coming when you need to look at giving Lewis more games. We know Pep likes him as a midfielder as well, but 
that's that's the one maybe I'm going to look out for that maybe we'll see Lewis playing a lot more as as a right back this year and, and Walker maybe not playing as much. But what about you, Joe? Any any breakout stars? Anyone you can see pushing their name into the hat this year that we'll be talking about at the end of the season that maybe we didn't think we'd be talking about? I mean, Oscar Bob can still do it if he's if he's out until mm. if he comes back in the new year and is is over his leg break and picks up where he left off. Then absolutely, he could be like a new signing in in January. I think, yeah, Lewis is going to be interesting. He was really, really good, but he doesn't want to play at right back. He wants to play midfield. Um, and maybe Oscar Bob's injury might need Kyle Walker to come back in and, and offer that support on the right, bombing up and down. Whereas if you had Bob and Savino and, and Doku and Foden, you might have been able to to go a little bit more direct in, in your tactics. But given the sort of, as we were saying before, the the options and the the way everything's changed in the last week or so, maybe for the time being you need Walker just to add a bit of consistency and 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 that. But I also think if Lewis, I think he'll start against Chelsea, and I think if he if he starts the season well, it, it's probably his place to lose. And I think he he will play more than he did last season if he if he keeps it up. But when I was jotting these down, I, I put I put Jeremy Doku, and I don't think he's much of a surprise. But he ended the season very well. He had a bit of a rocky patch in the middle. I think if he can kick on from that, he could be as good as anyone in in the squad and on the on the wings. And if he can just add that final sort of end product, he's he, he could be one of the best wingers in the in the league. And I think he could have a a big season. And he's got a real opportunity as well, especially with Alvarez and and Doku going. He's got a chance to sort of step up now and at the start of the season and and whether it's right or left, claim claim a, start, a Spartan starting spot. Yeah, 100%. That's uh, that's going to be one to watch as well. And like I say, he started last season brilliantly, ended the season well. So be interesting what's to come from him. Uh, right, that's all for today. Thanks for your time, Joe. And I'll uh, I'll see you in the queue for the press food at Stamford Bridge on Sunday. Can't wait. <laughs> uh, thanks see, for I'm listening, please. To it already. I can tell the enthusiasm just absolutely shone through then. It was uh, clearly, <laughs> clearly genuine. Um, thank you everybody for listening today. Please leave a review, like, subscribe. Remember to get the, the podcast in your feed throughout this season. We'll be back early next week, probably on Monday, to review the action from, from Stamford Bridge and the opening weekend of the season and any developments in the transfer market. But for now, thanks for listening and we'll catch you all soon.